Welcome and good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're watching this, to our latest GTSC Homeland Security Today um, webinar discussing the top Homeland Security issues of the day. And we are excited to have Thomas P. Vartanian joining us today to talk about his new book and about uh, rebuilding cyberspace. Uh, my name is Bridget Johnson. I'm managing editor of Homeland Security Today. Uh, Vartanian is the executive director of the Financial Technology and Cybersecurity Center. Throughout his career, he has represented parties in 30 of the 50 largest countries' financial institution collapses and has been at the forefront of the creation and implementation of new financial technologies. He served as general counsel of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board during the SNL crisis, as special assistant to the chief counsel of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and as chairman of the American Bar Association's Cyberspace excuse me, Law Committee. He has been a regular guest on national media, including Bloomberg TV, CNN, Fox News, and various radio shows. He's the author of 200 Years of American Financial Panics, and he is the author of the new book, The Unhackable Internet, How Rebuilding Cyberspace Can Create Real Security and Prevent Financial Collapse. Thomas, welcome to this webinar. We're really excited to have you. Thank you, Bridget. I'm delighted to be here. So I guess uh, the, the first question, you know, just seeing the, the title of the book is so intriguing, The Unhackable Internet, uh, because, of course, you know, what we hear from both public and private sector is that it's not a matter of, uh, you know, if, but when. So how do you get from that point of constantly being on defense to moving to the offense and saying, no, you're not going to breach this? Yeah, that's the $64,000 question I wanted to approach and, and deal with in the book, because I have worked on technology most of my professional career. And, you know, it started dawning upon me that everything we were doing after we built an online interface, and however it was structured with whatever security, everything we were doing was, was assuming that there would be a hack, assuming that there would be some downtime, and planning on getting back on our feet as quickly as possible. And if you look at any of the major hacks that have occurred over the last several several years, OPM, Solar Winds, Colonial, JPS, uh, JBS, uh, Lodge 4J, uh, Capital One, JP Morgan, all of those, one after another, you know, you get the, se the sense that there's a certain inevitability about all this. And as I started thinking about that in hindsight, and progressing from where I was 30 years ago as a technology acolyte, you know, really captured by the euphoria and hypnotized by the, by the mystery of technology, uh, I started to think about the fact that we were out of balance. And the balance point is that we have, and if you can read any government report in the last 25 years, and I've summarized a lot of them in my book, but you can read any government report in the last 25 years. and if you put the word cybersecurity in to the find uh, block box and you put in the words innovation, innovation comes up about 20 times more than cybersecurity. And it shows you what the emphasis of those reports and the emphasis has always been on, and that is innovation. Innovation, creating better competitive products, quicker products to get to market, products that can make a bigger profit. And so, you know, corporate America and I think the government have been captured and mesmerized by the innovation of technology, which is no doubt stupendous and has done enormously terrific things to enhance the quality of life. But what's happened is we've gotten out of balance. We've been so mesmerized and so hypnotized by the upside of innovation of technology that we've forgotten about security. We have forgotten about making sure that we're not creating vulnerabilities as fast as we're creating opportunities in the environment. And so that's what I started thinking about and writing about three years ago when I retired from the practice of law. And, you know, the more I read about this and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this is an issue that requires the, the attention of the policymakers in this country and, and any country around the world 
to sort of rebalance where we are and go from an internet where hacking is inevitable and downtime is inevitable to one that isn't going to be so inevitable and is more impenetrable. And we can do it if we really put our minds to it, but every day that passes that we don't do it, it gets a little harder to do it. That's a, that's a, a really fascinating start. You know, what you're saying about um, new emerging innovation technology, you know, what we constantly hear is that, oh, security is going to be baked into it. Um, but do you think it's been, um, shall we say, well done? <laughs> yeah, so, well done, but... so Bridget, that that is sort of the the essence of what's going on here, that question. Because, and, and remember now, I represented financial technology companies. I represented some of the largest financial institutions. I've seen this from the inside. And what I think is happening is we're all being captured by the profit of innovation, the profit potential of innovation. And we have ended up in a place that sort of allows us to launch first and patch second. And so I ask the question just as sort of as you ask it, and that is, I wonder if people are really taking the time to test the software and test the coding and put it you know, through the rigors that it would normally need to be before it comes to market. Because I believe what I saw in executives around the industry is what's happening everywhere. And that is, they want to get the product out. They want to get the software on the street. And they want to start making money from it. And the assumption is, whatever you need to patch, you can patch later. But the problem is, if you have a launch first and patch second approach, you're always going to be playing catch up. And the bad guys are, are always going to be just one step ahead of you. And so the question becomes, is coding adequate? Is software adequate? Is hardware that's getting into the market adequate? And I suspect that, that the inevitability of all these hacks answers that question in the negative. And, and that's why I think we need to change some perspective here. I hesitate, I hesitate as a small government guy to, to, to recommend an FDA, for example, for coding the software, but there needs to be some standards. There needs to be some test that you have to satisfy before you can throw that software out into the marketplace. It just can't be, let's test it in the market and see what we have to fix. And so how would, um, you know, concerns not just about the um, the level of the cybersecurity workforce, but the um, the ordinary staff at companies and agencies who can... Um, shall we say, let in vulnerabilities um, through through different means, through lack of education, through lack of training. Um, how does the, the human error become unhackable? Yeah, so the human error is a large part, as you know, uh, of the vulnerability uh, of, of cyberspace. And, and it's, it's something we're going to have to deal with just as much as we have to deal with coding, software, hardware, and every other technology. Uh, and what I have suggested in the book, and I've raised all these questions because as a lawyer, I didn't think I could write this book and just raise a bunch of questions and walk away and go home. I try to answer all the questions about how can we secure the internet to make it more, more impenetrable to these kinds of hacks. And so I talk about lots of different things, which includes um, standards for coding, um, the greater authentication to people rather than IP addresses and machines. So for example, if we could move to a system where there was no anonymity, it would change a substantial portion of the problems that we have online that are caused by people who know they are anonymous and know they're likely never to be caught or punished for what they're doing. Uh, thirdly, how about some governance? Let me give you an example, Bridget, of one of the things that I noticed when I was working on technology projects over the last 30 years. And that is that we were being asked as advisors to companies to essentially move the, your analog life into cyberspace. And that means moving all your data, personal and otherwise, uh, all your money, all your investments, all your knowledge. It's all going from the analog world onto into cyberspace. Now, when it exists in the analog world, I will bet you that you don't invite people into your home to rifle through your personal papers. I will bet you that you lock your doors of your home, particularly at night. 
And I will bet you that you are happy that there are police protecting your neighborhood, the city, the state, and that there are armies protecting the borders around the country. But the fact of the matter is we have moved everything that's important to us in the analog world into cyberspace, and we have none of that. We have no locks, we have no borders, we have no protections. You don't even know who to call if all your money or investments are gone tomorrow morning. There's no cyber police. There's no cyber Coast Guard giving us an early warning. And so we need to change all of those basic elements. And the last thing I talk about, and I go through a, a lot of these in the book, which I don't want to bore you with right now, but and I also don't want to take away my thunder in the book. But the last thing I, I talk about is, is the returning to what I call secure private networks. When I started in the banking business in the 1970s, there were no, there's no internet. There was no open architecture networks. It was all proprietary secured networks. So any payment system, any communication between the Fed and a bank, for example, or the treasury and a bank, uh, it was all private networks that were highly secured. And the day in 1994, when the first bank went online and, and allowed online banking was the day that the entire banking world was introduced to the open architecture of the internet. Because once you got into the system of one bank, theoretically, you were into the system of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and any place else you could hack your way into. And that changed the world dramatically. And so what I'm saying is, we ought to go back to secure private networks that you don't get on unless you satisfy a whole litany of tests, like who are you, what are you? Uh, do you agree to have a kill switch in your application? So if you don't follow the rules, we annihilate your application or your, your presence in this network. Um, are there rules of engagement that you're willing to live by? And, and do we have cyber police on this network that are going to enforce those rules? That's what we need to go back to, it seems to me, if we want to put every inch of data and every ounce of financial value we own in cyberspace. And I want to bring it back to your uh, to your sex, sector expertise for a minute here, um, because, you know, there's, there's been a lot of focus, of course, on critical infrastructure, cybersecurity with the water breaches um, and now, you know, concerns about power breaches after some physical attacks. But what is like a doomsday scenario for the financial sector? No, yeah, so I, I, I actually uh, I actually describe one in in the book. Uh, and I started with um, a guy named Stan who downloads a, a game on his phone, which of course has a virus and malware. And uh, he uses that phone, therefore, that morning to buy some coffee at Sam's National Coffee Shop. And from there, the virus penetrates uh, every inch and in, uh, aspect of the economy and shuts it down. Uh, and by the time, you know, one hour has passed and he's tried his ATM machine and that didn't work, he gets home and he can't even get home because the security system doesn't work. Well, people say, well, that's not realistic. And you know what? If you read, <laughs> there's a whole lot of terrific books out there by people who know this stuff inside out and have focused on it. Um, you know, um, Nicole Pullroth Pearl, wrote a book. She's a New York Times reporter on cybersecurity. She wrote a book called uh, Is This the Way It Ends? Uh, you know, <laughs> Is this the world, the world, the way the world ends? And it's an interesting book because she reports about all of the terrible things she's seen in her journalistic life about cybersecurity. And when you read all of that, you put it all together, and there's some great reports, Carnegie Mellon uh, um, Institute for International Peace has a terrific section uh, listing all of the incursions into the financial services business uh, around the world. You put all that together and you realize the doomsday scenario has happened. It has happened. It just has happened in little pieces around the world. So when all the banks went offline and everybody's money disappeared in Brazil, well, it didn't happen everywhere, but it happened in Brazil. When the lights went out in Estonia in 2007, in a dispute allegedly with Russians over the placement of a statute in the, in the capital, uh, everything stopped. The bank stopped. The news report stopped. Everything stopped. And then recently in Ukraine, we've had those same kinds of attacks. 
And so when you piece all that together, that doomsday scenario has occurred. It has just occurred in different pieces and parts. If you pull all of them together, in effect, you've had a single country stop, just stop for some period of time. Now, the question is how long that period of time lasts if it's a focused, persistent attack on everything in the country from water, defense, financial services. Just think about being without electricity and thing, being without your money for three or four days. I mean, it is a ca catastrophe. And could it happen? Absolutely. Is the, is the ability to do it out there? Sure, most of it's still with nation states. But the problem I talk about in the book is that as technology gets cheaper, that kind of potential devastating uh, power is going to be in the hands of not just nation states, who, who, who even if they're adverse to us, will play by the rules. So for example, China is not going to take down the economy of the United States because it's the functional equivalent of taking down the economy in China because we are so interrelated in terms of trading and everything else. But think about this technology getting in the, into the hands of terrorists, hackers, criminal cartels, um, and, and people who just don't play by the rules. I mean, the interesting thing is that criminal cartels are figuring out that it's much more efficient and much more uh, lucrative to be in the business of, of uh, ransomware, hacking, and all kinds of whatever evil you can think of on the web or the dark web, uh, rather than being in, in the traditional businesses that criminal cartels like the mafia were in. And so, you know, when that starts happening, there's no mutually assured destruction fear anymore. It's just some random groups with technology that may do things for fun and profit. And we've seen this wave of ransomware and, and damage it can cause uh, and, and how it works. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that's a business. The ransomware business is a business. It may be a bunch of guys sitting in a, in a room in Moldova or whatever the case may be, but it's a business. And, and, and so if you attack 10 companies a day, all you need is one to pay you and you're in great shape. So as long as cybersecurity has been an issue, um, all of the successive presidential administrations have you know, responded here and there in different ways with forming commissions or coming out with roadmaps or you know, um, just trying to find some sort of um, thing that, that will propel um, cybersecurity where it needs to be. Um, what is your opinion on where those 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 plans and that focus has been going and where it needs to go? Yeah, um, I guess what I'd say is, uh, if you want to buy a bridge, I've got one. It's in Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> and I'd say the same thing about the government. If you think the government is doing something about this issue, if you think it is doing something to protect uh, critical infrastructures. What I would recommend you do is, is, is read the section in my book where I go through all the government reports, and I include them all in, in the appendix of the book. The book may be worth it just for the appendix. I include all those reports in the appendix. And it doesn't take you long going through those reports. I started with the Clinton administration, because you know what? The Clinton administration identified the issues. They identified the issues in 1996 in the presidential directive. They, they, they identified critical infrastructures. They knew what the problems were. And in the 25 years since 1996, what we have done in presidential directives, executive orders, um, government reports by the GAO, whoever you want to think, congressional committees, you can read them all and they're all cited in my book. What they do is they sort of bake and rebake that same set of principles that the Clinton administration set out and the other thing they do that drives me absolutely out of my mind is all of these executive orders. Look at the, the, uh, the Biden executive order of May 12, 2021 on cybersecurity. It says the right things, you know, talks about some new things, actually, that, that I think he should get some credit for. But most of it is a rehash of the executive orders done by Trump, uh, Obama, Bush, and Clinton. It's just a rehash and, and a restatement of those same things. And what we, what we keep doing is we keep 
restating the same principles, the same problems, and the same solutions. And we never get any further than that. We have made little progress in the 25 years getting beyond that. And here's one reason why. All of these executive orders that, that you've referred to and I've cited in my book, what do they do? Well, at the end of the executive order, they say, we, the president delegates to the following to get this done. And inevitably, they delegate the cybersecurity tasks to about 24 different federal agencies. Now, the one thing I know, having been a federal regulator, is if 24 agencies are responsible to do something, nobody's responsible to do anything. And that's what's happening. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of discussion. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what the problem is, is the government takes responsibility for defending cyberspace, but cyberspace is basically owned by private companies who aren't allowed to shoot back. They aren't allowed to hack back by law. And so you have a peculiar situation that when, when uh, the solar winds uh, hack occurs or a colonial pipeline gets taken down by ransomware, it's not allowed to do anything in defense. Now, the government says, well, we'll take control of that problem and we'll take action at the appropriate time in the appropriate way. But you know what happens. That puts the defense of American corporations and any country's corporations in the hands of their government, which will put it in the hands of diplomats and politicians who are doing trade-offs and making considerations based on a whole number of things before them. And whether or not anything ever happens out of that is anybody's question. So it's an interesting situation we have, and that is, look, when, when you talk about the defense of the country, it's the military defending the borders. It's the Coast Guard defending the coast, right? In cyberspace, 95% of cyberspace is owned, networks, computers, hardware, software, owned by the private sector. So it's an unusual situation uh, that the private sector can't respond when it's directly affected, and the government may or may not respond based upon its particular whims and wishes at a particular time. And so uh, it is a very, very difficult situation. But the short answer to your question that, it, it, that I describe in the book is that in the last 25 years, not enough has happened to secure cyberspace. It's only getting worse. And one day, one of our presidents is going to get up at the podium in the White House and apologize for not having taken action sooner to secure cyberspace because of some attack that's happened. What are the defensive considerations that you think are of greatest import when it comes to adversarial nation state attacks versus ransomware games? Yeah. So um, let me just give you a sort of a, a list of the things that I've talked about and you know, you can you can look at Richard Clark's books. He, he talks about the same things. There's a number of books that talk about these. And and you know, the the, the bottom line, Bridget, is talk is cheap. And I don't think we're ever going to do some of these. I don't think we're ever going to change the internet that we've got. And that's why I suggest that we move to a different form of uh, of supplemental sidecar internet. These these secure private networks, because I don't think. There's the institutional will out there to change what we've built so far, to inconvenience users, to raise the costs of the internet and what it's about. I, I, I'm just not so sure that's going to happen because it hasn't happened in 25 years. So if you look at the bits and pieces of what has to happen to deal with ransomware, distributed denial of service attacks, hacking, whatever the case may be, you know, the first I mentioned is authentication. We have got to get away from anonymity as much as we possibly can. Second is governance. And what I talk about is AGE, the age process of the internet, authentication, governance, and enforcement. There's got to be police. There's got to be some price to be paid for violating the rules. Uh, the next thing I think is very important is zero trust architecture. The president, President Biden, put out a, an executive order ordering essentially all of the federal agencies to move to zero trust architecture I think by 2024. Um, and that means that once you're into a system, once you've been authenticated, you've gone through multi-factor uh, checking and authentication to get into a site, it doesn't mean you can go anywhere you want. 
you have to be authenticated. You have to be retrusted every time you move through that site, which I think would be an important step up in terms of uh, the use of the, of the internet. The other thing I talk about is liability for ineptness. And, and this is an important one. I, I think if we let corporations, businesses, government officials know there's a price to be paid for online ineptness, I think you'll see them step up their game. The concern I have right now is the price that a major corporation pays for getting hacked is relatively insignificant to the profits that they make. And so if you're the chief executive officer of that company, you know, you, you don't have a great incentive to spend a lot of money to become ultra secure when the price to be paid for insecurity is not very significant. And, and that's something we've got to change. We've got to increase the liability, perhaps to the government in terms of fines, perhaps to users in terms of the ability to bring lawsuits. But liability has to be ascertained so that people will feel responsible. The more they feel responsible, the more likely it is that they will increase uh, the amount of security that in the products they're dealing with. And the other thing I think that's incredibly important is transparency. There's remarkably little transparency out there in terms of what products are doing, what the government's doing. I mean, if you took the citizen on the street and asked them how the government protects them online, I think they probably know pretty much close to nothing on that subject, except to say, well, I know if the government's letting it happen, it must be safe. Because in this country, there's so much regulation, there's a sort of that underlying assumption and implication in everything we do. If the government lets it happen, it must be safe. The other thing, part of transparency is disclosure by companies. I mean, privacy, I think, is long since dead in this world. But do you ever see a company give you a disclosure about what they're doing with the data they're taking? Do, when you buy a refrigerator, do they tell you that that refrigerator is listening to you or it's clocking what food you use and, and, and categorizing it and transmitting that information back to the company? Where does that information go? I mean, the shocking thing about it, and it's a terrific book out by Shoshana Zuboff called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. It talks about how everybody's data, every click, Every keystroke on a computer produces data that's, that's captured, diced, sliced, sold, resold, and resold again for enormous different purposes. And we get relatively no disclosure, or we get disclosure in a 40-page uh, agreement in terms of use that nobody on this planet reads. I mean, there's nobody who doesn't click agree when that comes up without reading those terms of service because the terms of service are mind-numbingly uh, difficult to deal with. So those are the kinds of things we have to come to grips with. And, you know, as I go through a number of those in the book, I conclude that as a pragmatist, I, I don't think there's any chance that all of them are going to be done. And therefore, that's why I conclude that the only solution we've got here is to create new, secure, supplemental networks that do require those kinds of beefed up security measures before you can get onto them. What, um, from the cyberspace Solarium Commission report, um, do you think was most important and most neglected? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I'll tell you, that was a terrific report. Uh, and like most of the other reports, I talk about it extensively in the book, like most reports in the last 25 years, went largely unheeded you know, largely unattended to. Uh, in fairness, there were seven or eight of its recommendations adopted by Congress in legislation the year after in, the, in 2021. And I give everybody credit for that. But I'll tell you what I take from the Cyberspace Commission report, um, and, and that is its tone. I think the most important part of that report, as extensive, as detailed, and as professional as it was, was the tone. It was a cry for help. It was a warning shot, basically saying, we are falling behind. The Chinese are out there eating our lunch. Uh, and if we don't pay attention to these risks in cyberspace, they're only going to get worse. And we are going to, we are putting ourselves in jeopardy. And frankly, with whatever 
blob of humanity and machines the metaverse turns out to be, if we don't fix these problems before we all find ourselves functioning in the metaverse every day, uh, you know, I don't know that we'll ever fix them and we'll be in a real fix. Because, you know, the interesting thing, I'm, I've read a lot of um, books, obviously, to prepare for my book. And, and one of the more interesting things that I've been reading about is, is reading a little bit about neuroscience and uh, the brain and how the internet affects the brain. And the interesting thing that I think makes a lot of sense to me is, is that the internet is actually making humans dumber because it is inhibiting the, the synapses in the brain that comes from thinking and logic and making judgments. Because what do we do online? All that's done for us online, all we're doing is looking, we're foraging. It's a foraging exercise when we go online. So we're not thinking as much as we used to because we're assisted by a, a machine that does the thinking for us. On the other hand, I think everybody is well convinced that machines are getting smarter and smarter every day with artificial intelligence moving towards the pinnacle of artificial general intelligence. I mean, you can't pick up the newspaper or go online today at all without reading about some artificial intelligence mechanism or software uh, that is doing this or doing that or failing to do this or failing to do that. But if you think about it, if in fact, the neurologists and the people who study the brain are right, and we are getting dumber as human beings, and machines are getting smarter. You know, if you straight line that out, at some point those lines cross, and the machines are smarter than us. And, 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 and the question becomes, then who becomes the subject and who becomes the boss? And that's an interesting question um, that I think a number of authors have written about. And you know, I, the first time I saw The Matrix, the movie, I thought it was fantastical. And as I've read and worked in this area and thought more and more about it, I'm not sure it's so fantastical. Yeah, it's fascinating, too, that, you know, even just being like Generation X age or so, you remember not growing up with computers <laughs> and, you know, not growing up with all of this assistive technology and kind of remembering as well, we did okay, you know? Yeah, look, I remember, I remember when I started uh, in the government in 1976 as a young lawyer, I spent my weekends in the library, you know, foraging through books. And my assistant who did type briefs for me and other things, she was typing on a typewriter that used carbon paper between two or three pages to get copies. So, right. you know, we uh, it's not that long ago, we came from that prehistoric time. Right, right. So as we come uh, to the to the near end of the session here, I, I kind of want to just open the floor to you. You know, are there any um, elements of your book or the cyber landscape that we didn't touch on that you think are important to convey to the audience? Yeah, um, I think that um, the one thing I talk about in the book that really disturbs me is that in most of my 30 years of working on technology for financial institutions, and in a study I've done over the last three or five years, I've not heard anyone ask the question that I'm asking in this book. And that troubles me because the question I'm asking this, in this book is, did we build the right internet? Is this the internet we want to secure all of our data, all of our valuables, and all of our money? I don't think it is. But I, I, I am quizzical about that question isn't being asked. And so I asked myself the question, why isn't that question being asked? And, you know, it was asked in 2005. I found a study that the government um, funded. It involved Stanford, I think, and perhaps Berkeley labs in California. And it was called the Clean Slate Project. And it was a project to build a new internet from a clean slate that was more secure and worked differently. And a number of very prestigious computer scientists, strategists, tacticians worked on that project. And you can go online and you can find uh, some of the work product that they created. But at the end of the day, it and several other projects over the next 10 years 
simply died of their own weight. And, and nobody sort of explains why they died of their own weight. The only thing I can sort of conclude is that they couldn't get traction. They couldn't get anybody to pay attention because David, uh, I mean, Richard Clark says in his book, you know, cybersecurity is very hard to get anybody's attention about because the damage is invisible. You know, when Russia drops a bomb on Ukraine, there's visible damage, right? Everybody sees it. It's hard. It's horrific. And everybody knows that shouldn't happen. Uh, but when you see this cybersecurity attack, attacks, it's not the same kind of impact on the human psyche. And so we just keep going. You know, we just keep moving forward. And, and so I think the combination of a lack of, of, of real concern, the combination of a lack of political will to get anything done, combination of a lack of corporate will to get anything done, has just left this the way it is with nobody asking the question, did we build the right internet, but everybody trying to fix it. I mean, I guess from a, from a more uh, cynical point of view, you know, there's almost $500 uh, billion dollars of monies going to cybersecurity experts in this country. Uh, and that's a lot of money. And that's a lot of people making a lot of money from insecurity. Um, and so you have to ask yourself the question, well, are they more focused on running on that wheel, or are they more focused on trying to eliminate the problems of cybersecurity and at their, at their base cause, and that is how the internet operates. So I think, I think I spend a little time talking about that and why the question hasn't been asked, and, and basically conclude that the question should be asked. It should be taken up by policymakers, and the policymakers should include major corporations around the world. First of all, the United States doesn't own the internet. So, I mean, the internet is a global phenomena. Second of all, as we talked about, corporations own most of the internet or control most of the internet rather than governments. So my conclusion as to how to get this done is it's gotta be a grassroots effort from corporations. Business leaders have to come together and tell their legislators, this has gotta be fixed. We need a governance system. We need an enforcement system because our futures are at stake and because we can see the day when we can't make money from this internet. And that's why we have to fix it now. Is that going to happen? You know, I, I, I have, I have opined that it's not going to happen until we have some sort of digital Pearl Harbor or financial Armageddon occur. And, and that would be very sad if, 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 if we had to have that kind of an event before policymakers, business uh, CEOs and, and leaders come together and say, we should fix this. Well, Thomas, it has been a pleasure having you with us today. I mean, this has been very informative and we would love to have you back as the cyber landscape and threats and solutions evolve. Um, and I do want to end this by plugging for your book. <laughs> it is The Unhackable Internet and it's for sale now. It is for sale now. It's the it'll be delivered uh, publication date or just after, after it, February 15th. Excellent. Excellent. We, well, we can't wait. We can't wait to dig into that more and definitely um, hear more from you in the future as well. And thank you so much again for joining us. Bridget, thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. And for our audience, uh, please tune in to our forthcoming Homeland Security Today GTSC webinars as we cover a range of Homeland Security issues. And to everyone, have a wonderful day. And thank you, Thomas.